Raji James, My Part in His Downfall, by Raji James. Read by Raji James. Chapter 1 Hello, my name is Raji James and this is my autobiography that will hopefully be for sale in a shop. No doubt you already know me, which is why you have done a buying of this book. But if you don't know me, then you will definitely know me when you have read this book of my autobiography that will be at least 200 words long, or I have to give the fiver back to the publisher. I was hoping to include some pictures, but my ex-wife got all of them, thanks. So, what is an autobiography, I hear you asking, definitely? Well, that's a very good question, and I have looked it up. It is basically a book all about me. I don't mean that every autobiography is all about me, i.e. Raji. Heaven knows, even this one about me is one too many. No, an autobiography is a book that is all about me. So, that should make it clearer up, thanks. Anyway, let's get on with the story about my life, from my birth in 1923 to my suicide next week. I won't dwell on my early infant years too much. Let's be honest, there's not much to say that wasn't already covered in the Jungle Book. So let's start with when I got back from there. No sooner had I emigrated to England when I managed to track down my real family what had left me in the jungle by accident. My mum was called Elsie or something, probably, and my dad was called Evil Papa Raji. They were always fighting and calling me names, and saying that I couldn't live there, but I stayed anyway, because I knew that one day I would be well famous, and that would show them. In the first year that I was there, evil Papa Raji ran me over in a truck, and I was in hospital for ten years. The exhaust put a hole in the back of my head, which has never actually gone away, and I have to be careful with it, because sometimes thoughts leak out of it onto the floor, and you have to pick them up really quick before a dog eats them, otherwise they are lost forever. It is for that reason that this is actually the ninth draft of this book. Once I got all bettered up, I was allowed to leave the hospital, and my family had organised a big surprise party for me. I can remember it as clear as anything, due to the fact that I have literally only just made it up. There were jellies and balloons, and East Seventeen did a concert, which I suppose is when I got a taste for doing performing and acting and rapping, which I sometimes do. I'll never forget Brian Harvey singing that deep, deep down one as he interfered with me in the kitchen. Not long after, my mum and evil Papa Raji done a divorce for a bit, and as a joke they blamed me, evil Papa Raji went home to Africa and accidentally took me with him. Luckily, ten years later, my mum came out and rescued me, and I felt truly loved for the first time, until she told me that it was only because I had her co-op stamps book in my pocket and that she had been saving up for a soda stream which were all the rage in those olden days. A soda stream is basically a machine where you can put all syrup in it and it makes free pop for you to drink all up and do burping. I imagine I would have really loved enjoying having a go on it. How come you didn't, I hear you asking? Surely your mum took you back to the England and you were living with her when she bought it. Well, she did take me back, but I had other plans. My passion for performing was well and truly bonked on, and I wanted to get on with it, thanks. The train from Africa landed at London Airport, and I enrolled at the famous Anna Share Theatre School for Children, even though I was about 27 at this point. My mum was doing cheering, but that was because she was proud of me. As I packed my tent and sleeping bag, I felt the world at my feet. It was the beginning of my epic journey. It was time for me to become a star. Chapter 2 My first ten years at the Anna Share Theatre School for Children were spent hiding, as I technically wasn't really supposed to be there, as I hadn't actually applied for it, let alone be accepted. I lived in a cupboard for quite a while, which had a little ventilation shaft in it, where I could hear the lessons being all done up by my classmates, 
so that's how I did learning. I would sing along to all the songs, and I was soon asked to be in S Club Seven as Bradley. We done loads of concerts, and I made almost fourteen pounds, which was a lot of money once. My best bit was when we was on Live Aid or something. However, all good things must come to an end, and also S Club Seven must as well. We done a splitting up, and I had major Stephen Fry depression for years. I remember that I was sitting in my cupboard back at the Anna Share School doing lots of crying when there was a knock at the door. Come in, I said. Okay, said the voice on the other side. The door wiggled a bit but didn't open. You might have to kick the bottom of the door as you pull the handle, I said. Okay, said the voice again. There was a little bang at the bottom of the door, but it still didn't open. It still won't open, said the voice, which was a woman one. Hang on, I'll open it from the inside. I said. I got out of my sleeping bag and put some trousers on. It would have been a bit rude for me to open the door without any trousers on. I thought to myself. I also cleaned my teeth as I had fallen asleep that afternoon and could tell that my breath might be a bit suspect, like it is sometimes after you have been asleep for a bit. After cleaning my teeth and then listening to the radio for a bit, I remembered that there was somebody at the door. So ten years later, I went and opened it. It was Anna Share, the woman who was named after the theatre school, or it might have been the other way round. Hello, Anna Share, I said. Hello, Bradley, she said, which happened a lot. No, my name is Raji in real life, I said. Oh yes, sorry, said Anna Share. That's okay, Anna Share, I said. Then we had a conversation about something. You may know that the Anna Share Theatre School is well known for being the place where loads of people off East Enders went, and sure enough, I will be in East Enders in one of the later chapters, providing that my electricity keycard doesn't run out before I save this on a disc. Well, anyway, another program what all the people from Anna Share School, which I definitely went to, would go on was a program called Grange Hill, and was about a school. Anna Share asked me if I would like to go on it to play Benny Green, who was a child and good at football. Do fish swim? I said to Anna Share. Yes, said Anna Share. They have to, or they will die. Then that is what I mean. I said. I will be on Grange Hill, or I will die. Grange Hill was well famous in the olden days, and was probably best known as the place where Mark Fowler first got on the telly. It was probably where he got his bloomin' aids as well. Let me tell you, given all the kissing and drugs that would go on behind the scenes, not with me though. I was a main character in it for a few series, but was hardly in series four, except briefly walking past the camera sometimes and saying the odd flipping ek. I think it was because my balls dropped. Well, at least one of them did. I enjoyed my time on it, and it was where I first met Ed Gamble, who of course played Roland Browning. The DVD on Grange Hill is out now, and it is a PG certificate. Even though Trisha Yates called me a nignog in one episode, but don't get confused if you look for my name on the credits, as I used one of my stage names to play Benny Green. I was called Terry Sue Pat. Other stage names I use sometimes are Jimmy Mystery, Lenny Henry, and Moira Stewart. But we will get to them in a later chapter because my lecky meter is bleeping now. Oh, and Denzel Washington. That's another one. Chapter three. I feel a bit sick today, so I'm not going to write anything. Thanks. Chapter four. I don't want you to think that all I'd done in my life at this point was acting things. Sure, I was a lead character in Grange Hill for ten years. But when I left it, I had to do normal jobs like what normal people have to do instead of acting. I'm going to talk about some of them in this chapter, just to show you that I am an everyday guy who just got lucky, except for last year when I couldn't get a job for love nor money, neither of which I had either. When I left Grange Hill, I had to do my national service, which means you have to join the army by law. I soon became a sergeant in our group, and all my soldiers called me Sergeant Onion. Because my name is Raji and that rhymes with onion bhaji, so they called me Onion, which is short for that. It wasn't racist; it was just pally. Anyway, no sooner had we done our training of loads of running and an obstacle course, a bit like the one on Krypton Factor or Funhouse with Pat Sharp, 
Then we were sent off to Japan to fight in the Vietnam War, which was popular at the time. I packed my bow and arrow and got on an aeroplane to go and do the war. Like most people off Vietnam, I don't really like to talk about it. And I'm not just saying that because I'm making this up and don't really know anything about it. It is because it was very upsetting. And even to this day, I sometimes do crying when I get a Chinese takeaway because it reminds me of the war and the horrible bits of it. In fact, I hardly ever get a Chinese anymore because of this. And it isn't because I can't afford one. I just prefer pasties or a chicken tikka slice. Like I say, I don't really want to go over the details of the Vietnam War. But if you want to know what it was like, then just rent the video of Platoon or Rambo or Oh What a Lovely War. It was just like all of them. One of the things that I don't mind talking about the war in Vietnam, though, is the social aspect of it. We would have had a right good laugh around the campfire, often poking someone that we had killed with a stick for a laugh, or putting his hands on his willy, whilst always keeping an eye out for the gooks, of course. And that isn't racist, that is just what we called them. We smoked pot and listened to records on a tape, like Bob Dylan, The Doors, and Michael Bolton. It was whilst in China for the Vietnam War for ten years that I lost my virginity with a lovely Chinese girl who I forget the name of now, unfortunately. It was a beautiful evening, and we did kissing, which a lot of them usually wouldn't, and then I ever so carefully rolled a condom down the length of my penis while holding the teat end between my fingers to expel any excess air. Then I gently put my penis with the condom on it into her vagina and had full sexual intercourse to orgasm. You had to wear a condom in those days, as a lot of them had diseases up their fannies, but I didn't mind wearing it, as I had full sexual intercourse. And all that for 14 quid, which was what I had left from my royalties from S Club 7, but it was worth it to have full sexual intercourse. I never saw her again, but it was a really sexy night, and I remember it fondly as the night that I had full sexual intercourse. Well, I say I never saw her again. Imagine my surprise ten years later when I was at the cinema watching The Karate Kid and there she was, playing Mr. Miyagi. Modesty prevents me from saying that I was a little beige good luck charm during those stolen moments in Japan, but hey, perhaps some of my acting prowess rubbed off on her or, at the very least, spunked up her when we had full sexual intercourse, which we definitely did. Anyway, sooner or later, Hitler got killed and the Vietnam War ended, and we won. I got a medal, but I think I left it at my ex-wife's house, so there's something else that I'll never see again, along with my autographed Albert Square sign and one of my children. I came home to a hero's welcome but had fallen asleep under some coats on the coach, so missed it, sadly. I am reliably informed that it was a right good do, and Chaz and Dave were on. I got back to my house or flat or whatever it was that I was living in and put the kettle on to make a lovely cup of tea. I had the security of my sandwich round job that I had before I left but forgot to mention earlier on, and I was also a taxi driver as well and some other jobs. But I was aching to get back to doing my best job, which was acting. As I sat and drank all my tea up all nice through my mouth for ten years, I noticed that there was lots of mail on the floor right underneath the letterbox that I had got installed in the front door to help the postman put letters into my house. I went and got them by bending over and putting my hand out in a gripping motion, a bit like them machines at the fairground. Unlike those machines, I did actually manage to pick the letters up, though. Unlike the time I ended up putting almost a thousand pounds into that machine in Blackpool to get a bloody Garfield toy that my ex-wife didn't even want, really, and I never managed to win it anyway, and that was one of the reasons she left me. No, I left her, actually, if you must know. There were loads of letters from things like the gas man and the telephone man and a court, but one of them stuck out. It was a letter with a postmark of Coronation Street. 
It was from Hilda Ogden, and it was asking me if I would be on the program playing a ticket collector. I said yes and went and done it, and got ten pounds and a free dinner. So there is another job what I've done. Chapter Five. As soon as I had done that acting job on Coronation Street, the phone started ringing. It was mainly wrong numbers and sales calls because BT had given me an existing number by accident when I had moved house. But one of the calls that wasn't a wrong number or a sales call was a very interesting one from a bloke called Barry who wanted to be in charge of being my agent. I thought long and hard about it for ten years, but eventually said yes, thank you to him, as it looked like he might do a cry if I said no. Even to this day, Barry is my agent, and I always think it is very impressive that he manages to balance out his agency work with his dog walking and cleaning jobs. The job offers came flooding in, and I took them all, becoming well famous up, and having to try and sign autographs and all that. It was the eighties, and my life could not have been better, particularly when I was chosen to play Lando Calrissian in Star Wars, which was a brilliant thing to do, as Star Wars was well popular, and I got to meet Indiana Jones and R two D two. Now I shouldn't really tell you this, but all the best autobiographies have little exclusive and sensational revelations, so I will put some in mine, and this is one of them now. R two D two isn't even a real robot. It's all done with special effects, and this bloke called Tom Baker, who is proper small, and they put him inside it, and he wheels it about and does all them noises with his mouth. In fact, loads of the stuff on the Star Wars wasn't real. Like the spaceships and the light swords and me being in it, I had an amazing time, and it was the first time I had to grow a moustache to be on the telly films. The only sad bit was that I never got to meet Mr. Spock, but other than that, it was fine. When I travelled back to England from space, Barry was well excited because he had got a phone call of the BBC for me to star in my own comedy show. I was a little bit nervous because I had never done comedy before and was totally shit at it, just like I am to this day. But I thought I would give it a try because some of the things I had been in had come out funny by accident. Monkey Magic, for example, was hilarious when it was finished, but I had taken the role of Monkey very seriously, so was disappointed when everybody pissed themselves laughing at it. In fact, the only good thing to come out of doing the series of Monkey was the fact that I got to work with Ed Gamble again, who was playing the pig one. Anyway. Barry and me went into the BBC and had a meeting with a man, and they told me that they had been very impressed with me on New Faces and on Tis Was, and would like to offer me my own series to do in a funny way. Barry started to interrupt and say that he thought that they had done a mistaken identity, but luckily I kicked Barry under the table to make him shush, and we signed the contract. I went on to make five series of the Lenny Henry Show for the BBC with me in the starring role, and it was very popular and on telly, and I got one hundred pounds for it. But most importantly, girls started to talk to me. Well, one did. It was a proper whirlwindy romance. I took her out on a date, and we got married the next week. A month later, she had our two children. I have never been more prouder of anything in my life than my two sons, Delbert and Chalky, and even now, ten years later, I still sometimes see one of them every now and again. Things were going great for me, or at least they were for now. Don't forget that this is the Raji James autobiography, and I am definitely going to fuck it all up in the next chapter next week. Chapter Six. I took to family life like a paraplegic to swimming. Don't get me wrong. I well tried to be helpful with my two new sons, Leroy and Mr. Patel, but to no avail. My efforts at breastfeeding were scorned by my wife, who had already started getting on my nerves, and she would sometimes shout at me when all I was doing was trying to juggle the kittens what I had bought as a present for the babies. It's not even like I ever really dropped them that much, and on the few occasions I did lose my grip on them, I always had the presence of mind to quickly stick my foot out to break their fall. So heaven knows what she was bleating on about. One day, I was in the kitchen eating a pasty all up nice through my mouth and into my tummy when my wife walked in and slapped me really hard around my face and said, "Why don't you just join the bloody circus?" Right, I will, I said, and stormed out of the house. 
Then I stormed back into the house and put some trousers on, and then stormed out of it again. When I got to the bottom of the road, I realized that I would be well cold with only a pair of trousers on. So went back to the house and stormed in again, and then put on a shirt and some socks and shoes, cleaned my teeth and got my car keys, combed my hair all nice, and then put a jacket on, and then stormed out of the house again. That would show her, I thought. It would only be a matter of time before she phoned me up on my mobile and begged me to come back. I sat in the car for seventeen days, but she didn't phone my mobile. I think partly because it was 1981 and they hadn't even been invented yet, but also partly because she didn't like me, and was also partly because she could be well stubborn. That old wife of mine. I was desperate for both types of toilet, and all the time I could hear her voice saying, "Join the circus! Join the circus!" There was only one thing for it. I went to Sega World, which had just opened at the Trocadero in London, and spent literally all of my money on Space Invaders. The computer game, not the crisps. Although I do really like the crisps, particularly the beef ones. Strangely, I walked out of Sega World four days later into the pouring rain, wondering what on earth I was going to do. I don't mean about the rain. I could hardly control that, no matter what you might have read about my culture. I meant about the fact that I had no money and was now a proper homeless. I still had my car, so wandered around London when all the pubs had shut, asking people if they wanted a mini cab. Ten years later, I finally got a fare to take a bloke with a massive beard up to Camden. Unfortunately, I only had enough petrol to get as far as Euston, but I was kind enough to give him a piggyback for the last couple of miles to his house. When we got there, I could tell he was well impressed with my level of customer service, and so he gave me one pound and then a tip of ten p as well, which made about one pound ten p in total. I was happy to have some money at last. As, if I am honest, I was getting a bit worried that somebody might have beat my high score on Space Invaders by now, not the crisps. So I started the trundle back to Sega World. I was about seven feet away when the bloke who I had given the taxi ride then piggyback shouted after me. "Hey!" he shouted. "Yes, thanks," I said. "I know this is a bit of a long shot, but I don't suppose you are any good at juggling, are you?" he inquired quizzically. Not too bad," I said. "Although I have only really done it with kittens so far." "That's perfect," he said. "I am about to start a circus, and I need a juggler and also somebody to do the trampoline." Can you believe that? A ten p tip and a pound fare, making one pound and ten p, and then the two things that I really loved, and I was being offered the chance to do them in a circus, like what my wife had shouted into my face. "Would you like to be in my circus?" the man said. Do fish swim? I said. I don't know," said the man. "I'm not actually from this country." Well, they do," I said. "Okay," said the man with a confused look. "But do you want to be in my circus?" "Yes," I said. From that moment on, me and the man with the big beard became lifelong friends, and within a couple of weeks, I, little Raji James, was the star attraction at Osama bin Laden's traveling circus. Even though I got stopped from juggling after that kitten died from being kicked in the head. We travelled all over the country, and the people came from miles around to see me bounce up and down on my trampoline for an hour before the grand finale, where I did a roly poly on it. I had never been happier in all my life, working hard in the daytime and then staying up late with the sama, drinking perno, getting well drunk, and making brilliant jokes about flying planes into buildings. <laughs> he was a bloody nutter and fucking hilarious when he was drunk. But you could just tell that he was one of the good guys and a really nice bloke who wouldn't harm a fly, even though sometimes he would fire guns into the air with a big bang and shout, "Death to the inkwells!" Which I didn't know what that meant, but it just sounded funny, and I would clap my hands and giggle every time he done it. Like I say, though, the daytimes were hard work, and I would often get blisters on my feet from bouncing up and down, practicing on my trampoline. But I have to tell you. I bloody loved bouncing and loved my trampoline far more than I ever loved my wife. One time, after I'd been practicing bouncing up in the air and then landing on my bum, I vowed there and then that one day I would have a trampoline of my own in my back garden, even if I only had like a hundred quid or something in the bank, and the trampoline actually cost a hundred quid and my rent was due. I would still buy the trampoline and my life would be complete. Just then, my agent Barry came into the tent and said. Raji, do you want to be on the bill or not? I looked at him for a moment and then smiled. Do fish swim? 
I said. Barry smiled too. Chapter Seven. The reason that Barry was smiling was because he was confused, as he had never actually heard of fish, and actually thought that the stuff you got from the chippy was some sort of fruit. When I explained to him that this was just my well clever way of saying yes, I would like to be in the bill, he smiled in a better way. Thinking about it, that first smile he done hadn't actually looked that happy. More like the smile you do when you are trying to remember if you left the cooker on, or how old you are, or which house you live in now. Anyway, I was given the part of DS Singh in the bill, and that was that. He had to be a DS, as if he was a DI, then he would be called DI Singh, which would be a funny joke, but no good in the bill, which is a serious teleprogram all about polices. And sure enough, my scripts reflected that with some great stories about my character getting files for other people, or just standing around in the background with my face out. A lot of people don't know this, but when you go on the bill, you actually get all your scripts for the next two years in advance, and have to go and learn them all up by reading them and trying to keep them inside your head, just in time to say them to the other proper actors. I decided that the circus would be well too distracting a place to learn up my lines, so sadly had to leave it. Osama bin Laden was well upset after I told him I was leaving, as he had booked me some flying lessons for my birthday. But he calmed down long enough for us to do our last bumming, and then we parted company with a tear and a handshake like gentlemen. Then we had a long kiss with tongues out, and I got on the bus. I had decided to go up to Salford to learn my lines, where one of my families lived. I thought it might be helpful to get out of the way up north, but as soon as I got there, my evil twin brother Jimmy Mystery told me that he had agreed for a local TV company to film a fly on the wall documentary about us whilst I was staying there. It was called East is East. And couldn't have been filmed at a worse time, as we were having all family troubles that had something to do with a wedding or something. I don't know. I stopped watching it after about forty minutes, to be honest. Not only was it embarrassing because of the family problems, but Jimmy kept hogging all the limelight and sticking his head in front of mine whilst they were filming, and generally just being all better at it than me. It would be the bloody story of my life. The time came for me to go back down to London and start being in the bill. I arrived at the studio on my first day to do a really important scene where I had to walk down some steps in the distance while the proper characters done acting up close. I didn't really know where I was meant to go, so followed the signs to the reception and rang the bell. The man behind it looked confused. "Hello, I am Raji James," I said, "and I am here to be the brown one in the bill." The man still said nothing and just stared at me. I have learned all my lines," I continued, "and can I just say how much I am looking forward to being on it? It is well my favourite program after Star Trek and Button Moon, and I am hoping that we shall have a long and fruitful relationship." Cut! Somebody shouted from behind me, and loads of people popped their heads around the windows and out from under the reception desk and stuff. I looked around, bewildered, like normal. I hadn't noticed that there were thirty people behind me with all lights and cameras and microphones and stuff, and the bloke who had shouted "cut" came walking towards me, all angry. "Who the f is this?" he said. Well, actually, he said the fuck word properly, but I don't think I'm allowed to swear in this. He says he's called Bargy," said the man behind the reception, who I would later find out was called Bob Cryer. I was about to correct him when I saw a familiar face by the side of the desk. Reg, off the bill! I shouted and pointed right into the face of my old school friend. Reg looked all confused, in a similar way that Bob Cryer had, and everybody else that had ever met me come to think about it. Reg, it's me, Raji! I said, all excited, whilst holding my penis so I didn't do a giddy wee in my trousers. Reg, I can't believe you are here. I thought you got eaten by a polar bear. No, Raji," said Reg from the bill. "That was just Ed's Arctic Raji snowy adventure story in the last series of the podcast." Oh, I said. The bloke who had shouted "cut" was still looking quite angry and was visibly trying to calm himself down. "I can't believe I am finally the brown one in the bill!" I shouted out. There was a pause, and everybody looked at each other. Finally, Reg said, "Um." Raji, could you just go in that room and get me a pencil, please? Of course I can, Reg from the bill. I shouted. I don't know why I kept shouting. I also threw my hands into the air for dramatic effect and grinned a big smile, which was a bad idea. As soon as I had stopped pinching my willy, loads of giddy wee came out and went all down my legs. 
I went and ran into the room that Reg from the Bill was pointing at, so I could get his pencil, and also so nobody could smell me. I looked around, but there was no pencil in the room. Matter of fact, there was nothing in the room. How odd, I thought. But all became clear when the door slammed behind me and the room started to jiggle about like it was moving or something. Then the walls fell down to reveal that I was actually in a cage and Bob Cryer was dancing about, laughing outside it and climbing up onto what appeared to be a horse-drawn carriage in front of the cage. Another exclusive for my autobiography, dear reader. Bob Cryer was the child catcher of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And as I sat shivering and frightened as he took me away, I could just make out the figure of my evil twin brother Jimmy Mystery arriving on the set of the bill and everybody clapping and cuddling him. Chapter 8 When we got back to his lair, the child catcher Bob Cryer left me all on myself in a rubbish cell. As I sat alone, I had the chance to think about all the good times I'd had on the bill, like when I arrived and got kidnapped by Bob Cryer, and that was it. Then I played a competition between my two bollocks, a bit like Conkers, but more stingy. Just as the left one was turning purple, I heard a scrabbling from the other side of the wall. It must be a rat, I had as a thought in my brain, which often made my nose do a bleed. Hello, said a small voice. It must be a talking rat, I bled. Hello, is that Ratatouille? I said too loudly for normal people. No, said Ratatouille. It is Ben Shepherd off the telly. Just then, I got a zing in my ding -a ling like the black man says to Stephen Fry on the tea adverts. This was because, ever since I was a little Raji, I had a bloody great big bonk on for Ben Shepherd. We have to get out of here said Ratatouille, I mean, Ben Shepherd. I know, I said, but how? I can't believe I managed to say this whilst I was imagining Ben naked on top of a white horse eating the dairy milk. Do you remember the great escape? said Bill. I set to work straight away. Ten years later, I had remembered the great escape. Well, said Ben, who sounded quite old and tired now, we need to do what they did in that. After ten years of trying to break down the wall with a bouncy ball, Ben informed me of my mistake. Luckily, he had already dug a massive tunnel. We travelled through that tunnel for twenty minutes before I got lost, taking a left turn into some soil. I lay there encased in dirt for ten years, like a little Bollywood fossil. One day, there was a disturbance of the ground and I looked up. Someone was digging above me. The light shone through and blinded me all up proper. All I could hear was a deep, booming voice saying, Alan, I think I found a mole. It was Tommy off ground force. He pulled me out of the ground by the scruff of my neck and plopped me in a water feature to wash off the mud. At the end of the day, Alan said it was all right for Tommy to take me home, so he placed me in his bum bag and took me back to his shed where he lived. There he let me live in his sink, naked, using chopsticks to catch flies for his newt. One day, he grew angry with me all up because I couldn't find any flies all nice for his pet up. He threw me full pelt out of his shed where he lived and sent me careering towards a tree. I hit the branches and dislodged a cat which was stuck up there. A woman rushed over to me and said, Thank you so much. My cat got stuck up there two days ago and I didn't know how I was going to get it down. She pressed a tiny penny into my hand. Tommy had seen what happened and stood over me. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, he said, smiling. I hoped I was, but the chances that he was thinking of a tiny beetle on a human-sized bicycle were slim. It turns out that he wanted to form a superhero team, where he threw me into trees and tall bushes to dislodge people's important things. For ten years we travelled the country as Tommy Gardner and his little brown frisbee. We were very successful, thanks, and well popular, only killing one girl and twelve boys. But soon things began to take a turn for the worse. We had some proper good rivals in that form of Jeff Capes and Amit the Human Boomerang, and Tommy was getting desperate. I would meet my rival later in life, probably in the next chapter, as it is nearly the end and we haven't done EastEnders yet. 
Tommy started to steal things, all up horrid thanks, and putting them in trees and tall bushes and pylons, just so people would pay us to get them down. One day, I told Tommy that I wouldn't be part of it any more, and he angrily hurled me, just as he had done all those years ago. I flew through the air and landed straight in a sewer. I bobbed around there for many years, ten, before I felt the surge of water push me upwards. I was in darkness, but I could hear muffled voices. Suddenly there was light, and I realized that I was in someone's toilet and that they had just opened it. As hot piss cascaded over my chops, I began to wish that I was back with Bob Cryer in my cell. The stream finished, and I looked up to see a face staring down at me. I recognized it. It was the face of Sonia Jackson, and I had washed up in Albert Square, London. Chapter 9 I scrambled out of the bowl and scuttled out of the bathroom, my little bare feet slipping on the lino. Finally I had arrived in Albert Square, which has taken bloody weeks, seeing as this is the main thing what I have done, apart from maybe East is East, but nobody even remembers me from that anyway. Oh, thank God, we have been waiting for you, said a voice. It was the producer of East Enders, who was called something. He said that they had been waiting for me to come and read my lines for ages, and kept calling me Richard Blackwood for some reason. And so began my time on the square. Contrary to popular belief, I didn't go straight into playing a main part. I started by mainly playing small cameos. If you look carefully, you can see me in one of the machines in the laundrette in one episode, as well as the time I played the bust of Queen Victoria on the bar of the pub. There was, of course, the time I replaced Wendy Richard as Pauline Fowler for one episode, but nobody is allowed to bring that up under BBC law. Ten years later, the producer came to me with a proposition. Hi, Richard, he said. Raji, I replied. He smiled and nodded. Later, I would find out that this was because he thought that Raji was African for hello. Richard, we want you to take a regular part in the show. There's a new family I think you would be perfect for. He took me to a little room where there were some other people sitting. One of them was Amit, the human boomerang off the last chapter. Ladies and gentlemen, said the producer, the Ferreira family are complete. There was a rumble in the ground and outside, and some lightning struck. It was said that at that moment all the babies in the world started to cry. I was in a family with Pooja, Amit, and Ray. There was also a man who was playing our dad, but I never found out what his name was. This is because he did one scene with me, screamed, I can't work with this, and ran away, never to be seen again. The first few months were great, but the only problem was I didn't really have any friends there. Sure, there were many people I tried to be friends with, like Dean Gaffney, Shane Ritchie from Daz, and of course, Steve Owen off Duran Duran. My only friend went by the name of Wellard. We had a short but passionate affair, doing it everywhere from Ian's calf to Barry Evans' video shop. However, under the surface of the program, things were bubbling away. People were not happy with my performance. I would do things like turn up on set with no trousers on and go into an American accent for no reason, which was apparently not considered good practice. The critics were out to get me and the rest of my family, but my relationship with Wellard was going swimmingly. It had come to the time when we were to go on our first holiday together. We jetted off to Barbados, which is in France, and had a whale of a time. I arrived back on the square, feeling refreshed. I walked towards the house where my character lived. This was where I lived in real life as well, as I had a lot of money to pay for the Raji puppies that Wellard had just done. But the house was not there any more. I spun round to see the producer laughing. Oh, Richard, he said. Raji, I said. No, Richard, it's no time for hellos. It's time to say goodbye. As he walked off, I could swear I could see Jimmy Mystery's face in the back of his head. I couldn't believe my time was over on Albert Square. I waved goodbye to Barbara Windsor, who gave me that two-finger wave that she always did. God, she is so saucy. Then the emotion overtook me. I burst into tears and ran off into Sherwood Forest, which was next to the set. I ran for what seemed like two days until I banged into someone. I looked up and saw the outline of Keith Allen's.
Chapter 10 I basically gave Keith Allens a nearly kiss and then had an adventure with Robin Hoodface and the BBC all filmed it up and that was on BBC One, so you can shut up. What else was there? It's bloody chapter 10 at the moment, and so my autonobiogramy is nearly bloody finished, so there must have been some other stuff going on in my career, and my life, and fun for all the family, which I haven't got anymore. Oh yes, that was it. I was in Doctor Who. I don't mean I put my Willy Wodger up David Tennant's bum, although I would do that given half the chance, but he probably won't let me. But if you see him, ask anyway so I can be sure. What I mean about being in Doctor Who was that I was in the telly program. I played a dentist and had a remote control phone all sellotaped to my head whilst talking to Billy Piper off Chris Evans that time, and then I got my brain sucked out by Dusty Bin off 321. When you are on Doctor Who, you get loads of fans who bloody love you and they all write to you and you can go to conventions and do your autograph for five pounds. A lot of people, like Ray, get all annoyed by the Doctor Who fans, or Trekkies as they like to be called, because they are fucking maniacs who ask you all questions about your character that you couldn't possibly know about, and they won't take bloody no for an answer. But I have a very good relationship with the Doctor Who fans. In fact, I did a signing at some shit Doctor Who shop in a revolting part of London on the 1st of December last year, and almost 12 of them turned up, which was good, considering that I was only there for five fucking hours sat on my own at the back of the shop. When I was at the signing, I went to the bank to draw some money out to give to the shop owner because I had wasted so much of her time. When I was there, I bumped into the head of the press for the bank who immediately asked me to be in their adverts. It was from then on that I was known as Howard off the Halifax, when I got to do singing and dancing and annoying everybody all up. I'll be honest with you, I'm actually struggling to write this chapter this week. I can't even see the paper on my typewriter because Ed snapped my glasses all in half, which is annoying. Speaking of things that have pissed me off recently, how come I wasn't invited to Frank Butcher's funeral on EastEnders? Everybody else was there, but I had to watch it round Ray's house, whilst Ray and Ed done loads of laughing in my face because they could tell that I was looking really carefully at all the flashback scenes to see if I was in the background so that I could get another £6 off the BBC for repeat fees to go towards my exhaust. Anyway, where was I? Oh yes, the Halifax adverts what I done were successful but a lot of people don't know that during the filming of those commercials I actually lost one of my legs and a bollock. It isn't even a very interesting story to be honest, gangrene, but I will tell the whole thing in the next volume of my autobiography, which comes out in two years and is provisionally titled, Why Am I Still Not Fucking Working? It is sad that I'm coming towards the end of this autobiography because there is so much I have not had the chance to include, like being an Oompa Loompa on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, playing the Crab Sebastian in The Little Mermaid, making a hit single called Pass the Duchy and earning plenty of Wonga for being a Rusty Lee lookalike at posh parties. Once, when I was doing a film about curry, I met a woman off Australian who said that they wanted a twiglet in another programme. The programme was called Kick, and you won't have heard of it unless you live in Australia, which is the only place where it was on, and you will probably know of it as a different name which isn't Kick, but still has only one syllable. Anyway, I was in my house packing all my clothes and shoe up to go to Australia for a year to do the filming, and full of fun and life and excitement. I couldn't bloody wait to get there. And just then, my portable telephone rang. Hello, thanks, I said. Hello, Raji said the voice on the other end of the phone. Osama Bin Laden, I shouted. Oh my god, I haven't spoken to you for ages. I know, Raji, Osama said. It has been ages since you worked on my circus and then left it for the bill. Yes, sorry about that, I said. If it is any consolation, I ended up in a cage on my first day and within a few weeks I was Tommy Walsh's brown frisbee. Well, that is okay, Osama said. You can make it up to me now. 
I have fallen on hard times, but have been offered a million thousand billion pounds for one last performance of my circus next week, but only on the proviso that you come and do your old trampoline act again. Oh, I said, the thing is, Osama, I am about to leave for Australia to be in a new sitcom called Kick. I've never heard of it, Osama said. <laughs> that won't change, I said. So, you won't do it, Raji. I can't, Osama. I'm sorry. There was silence down the phone. Are you there, Osama? I said. I am here, Raji, Osama said. But something in his voice had changed. Please don't be upset, Osama, I said. Fuck you, Osama snapped. You're angry, Osama, I said. Too right I am angry, said Osama. I helped you out when you were a human taxi in Leicester Square and didn't have a pot to piss in, and now you won't help me out in my hour of need. Please calm down, I pleaded. I will not calm down, Raji. In fact, you have tipped me over the edge. I will show you how angry I am. I will show you what you have driven me to. I will show the world. The phone clicked off. Now, I'll admit, I was scared at the time that Osama would do something stupid. But this was back in August 2001, and I am happy to report that I never heard of anything bad happening because of Osama, so he probably just had a beer and chilled out. Wherever he is now, I wish him well. Great guy. I even heard a rumour that he is running to be the first black president of America, so that is good. I flew off to Australia on aeroplane, which is a bit like train, but they check up my bum before I go on. The flight was wonderful, and the TV station even splashed out for me to sit in one of the seats, rather than in the cargo hold like usual. I had two packets of complimentary peanuts, and then they offered me drinks. First I had a Diet Coke, and then a water, bottled as well. Evian, if you must know, it was all free very swanky. Then they gave us a meal, a choice as well, and I chose the vegetarian option, even though I'm not a vegetarian. It was peppers and nut loaf, which was actually delicious, even though it doesn't sound it. Then I watched a film, which was Shrek, very funny, lol, times three. All in all, it was a wonderful flight. I got to Australia and ruined kick and flew back. For the return, I was sitting on the landing gear. I was showing them. They all said I would never work again after EastEnders, but I was coming back to Blighty with the world at my feet and my pants pulled up really high. My fans will have missed me, and they probably couldn't wait to see me again. When I was back on Rule Britannia, God Save the King, as a special treat, I went out to a comedy club. Please welcome to the stage, Ray Peacock! said an announcement, and as the magnificent creature strode onto the stage, I sat back and thought that this would be a good night. Final Chapter This chapter is my chance to finally lay to rest some of the misconceptions about me that I have stupidly allowed to flourish. So please, sit back and relax as I bring you, for the first time, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The end of my story so far begins here. It was a cold winter night when I finally arrived back in Heathrow Airport on a plane to London, England, where I had left so long ago, ten years probably. It was a shame it was so cold because I was still dressed in my traditional Australian clothes of a vest, pants and thong. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Why was I only wearing underwear? I wasn't, lol. In Australia, where I had just come from ten hours ago, if you don't include the bit where I was in Bombay from India, pants are called trousers or shorts, and thongs are flip-flops. A vest is still a vest. Lol, again. It was cold though, and I suddenly thought after a while that maybe 
it had possibly been a bad idea to leave all my other clothes and things in Australia. And suddenly, without much warning at all, I cheered myself up with another brilliant thought which I had, which was that I would soon be going back to Australia to do something I had never, ever done before, which was called a second series of something that I was in. All the really nice people that I had been near in Australia had promised me that they would phone me soon with directions and everything as to how to go back and do some more stuff with them all. Not stuff as in rude stuff. I didn't do any of that, even though I would have liked to with one of them who shall remain nameless. So, yeah, not that stuff, but stuff to do with me pretending to be a doctor and everything. I decided to go home and wait for them to call which would probably be really soon. When I got home in a taxi, which I paid for with £10 notes, which incidentally were a bit like Australian dollars but could be ripped in half, which dollars from Australia can't by the way, I was a bit confused because my key wouldn't open the door and the woman in the house told me that I didn't live there anymore because I'd left from living there and had to go live somewhere else in time for Christmas when my two children would come and see me. I remembered that I had been really looking forward to that happening so I did what I was told and decided all by myself to go round the corner and live in a room with a nice man called my brother. Then at New Year I was even luckier because as well as New Year I had another Christmas. This time I was with my children and we played with all the exotic traditional toys that I had bought for them from all over the world like an iPod from Singapore and a Wii from Greece on eBay and a noisy pretend motorbike from Toys R Us. After Christmas and New Year and everything I began doing all the things I had worked so hard and for so long towards. Like waiting for Australia to phone me and say it was time to come back. I waited for 10 months and finally the call came. I was so delighted, mainly because I still had no more clothes and had spent most of my money on things that I had bought like a trampoline which I loved and didn't go on much because of my sore foot which still isn't better really and stopped me from doing a run to save cancer. None of that mattered anymore though because the news was finally in that the Australians would have loved me to go back and do another series of the thing that I was in called Kick. The only sad thing was that there were these other people called The Studio who didn't want anyone ever, ever to make a series of the something I was in called Kick. I'd forgotten that Australia was another country and that sometimes they speak a different language. A bit like when an Indian man shakes his head and looks like he's saying no, but he actually means maybe, yes. Or when your agent says not to worry but he actually means you'll never get any work and have to sell everything and still get evicted from your house that you've got even though you've bought an iron and everything. That's what it was like, a bit. My life has been so exciting so far. I can only imagine what the next so far of it will be like. So let's all agree to call this bit Volume 1 and then I can start doing stuff from Kill Bill Volume 2 and tell you all about it again and everything. So. Tata from me, and <laughs> so long from him. All the bestest, Raji. Raji James, My Part in His Downfall by Raji James was read by Raji James, was written by Ray Peacock and Ed Gamble with additional material by Raji James. The title was submitted by Jez Scharf and this audiobook has been produced by Laura Barron. Could you come to custom?
your services, please. Little Roger James, who ruined his tenders, your daddy is waiting, he's down on his knees. But then, five weeks later, there was still no sign of little Roger James, who ruined his tenders. We thought he would be the first in line, but he was too busy organizing vendors. Little Roger James, who ruined Standards. Could you come to customer services, please? Little Roger James, who ruined the standards. Your daddy is waiting, still on his knees. Ed Rap. Little Roger James, rolling in the hood. Watch out, kids, because he's got wood. I'm picking it, picking it, picking it. He's picking his nose, I'm flicking it. Wanna wanna mix it, wanna wanna mix it. Just like Jim, he's going to fix it. Little Roger James, who ruined could you come to customer services, please? Little Roger James, who ruined his tenders. Your daddy is waiting, he's down on his knees. Roger section. I'm not playing. Little Roger James, who ruined his tenders. Everybody, come to customer services, please. Little Roger James, who ruined his tenders. Your daddy is waiting, he's down on his knees. Christmas number one all over it.